Greetings, friends. I hope everyone is doing well. So the speaker seems to, um, to have uh, some problems joining us. So if you just give us a minute, please. Okay, friends, um, I think um, to use our time more effectively, um, but in the meantime, I'm going to open it up for discussions on some, um, to hopefully receive your feedback. So we're gonna open it up for people um, that we can unmute people. Um, so if you would like to share what are your thoughts so far on Kumi, um, we've been, uh, um, we've been, we've, um, we're in the middle of the year with over uh, than 25 sessions we've held on a weekly basis. So if you'd like to share on how helpful you are finding Kumi or any ideas that you think would be needed to improve it, please just raise your hand and we'll open it. No need for you to type it in the chat if you're willing to, to join us. We'd really appreciate this, uh, receiving the feedback from you. Yes, uh, Judith. Well, um, I'm sure many people agree with me. It's so educational, Omar, and it's such a thing I would look forward to. I would rather be here than anywhere else on this, this time of day on Tuesday. Um, I'm so glad you do this. I, I've just learned so much. And, you know, being so far away from Israel, Palestine, I'm in Anderson, South Carolina. I just love this connection and I so appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Thank you also for your commitment. Um, uh, Fahed, Reverend Fahed, Abu Afil. Uh, I would say I am uh, learning every week from you. The programs are not routine. Everything you do is new, and we learn. I like two things to be added to it. One, uh, create or two, three, call a senator, uh, do something in the church. I like for us to move toward action oriented. That's number one. Number two, we really need to have an intentional recruitment for other individuals to join us because all the activists can get more ammunition to deal with the issue through your program than any other program. So I, I think we have 75 godly people. We need to have another 75. Another, I mean, we need really more people to learn from you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Fahed. But I'm sure there's always space for uh, for us to develop, and I think there are some maybe some uh, um, some areas of Kumi that we could really make it. Um, we've used so many different ideas, or uh, um, I mean, in the past couple of years at least, we've used so many different ways of conducting the Kumi meetings. At certain times, we had the update on the ground, um, and other sessions we had actually the. Um, uh, we had like polls or sometimes doing the actions, the Kumi actions together. Is there any of these points that you guys miss or you think that these were good points of doing Kumi? Yes, Darren, you wanted to say something? No, except to say that uh, now that you mentioned it, I, I think uh, every week, uh, suggested an action that we do. In fact, the following week, we were checked up upon as to whether we actually did anything. So I think uh, I'm, I'm glad I had brought that back up again, though. It's important that we find ways. And I thought I got a lot of out of the last meeting uh, with Daniel Seidemann, but it was, so, I, I found myself so discouraged in a way, because, I mean, uh, he's just putting it right out there that, you know, this, uh, Israeli government is becoming so intentionally right wing and so nationalist and so racist 
I mean, it's hard to understand how, pre well, maybe it isn't, how our, I, our President Biden can still give us such unqualified support when we're over set, over, uh, we're beset with such racism and right-wingism in our own country. Anyway, uh, I'm so grateful for this every Tuesday morning, and I hope that, as somebody suggested, maybe if I had that, we find more people to join in with us who really want to know what they can do. I had you do a great job. I remember when you first brought this up to some of us at a Sabio conference up in, I think, uh, up in uh, uh, Milwaukee or Minneapolis or somewhere. And you were just talking about this possibility of of uh, Kumi now, and you've made this thing flourish and grow. And thank you for that very much. That was back in 2018, I think, somewhere around there. Thank you. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, could you please unmute yourself? It seems that this year has been um, I like I like the format. It seems like it's changed a little bit. Um, and it's been very, very um helpful to me i've learned a lot and uh i like that whatever it is you've done this year that's different it seems to be helping me and um especially lately and and especially the daniel sideman i i take notes and i can't remember all the details but i've been recommending that that particular session it was i mean daryl thought it found it depressing i found it very educational it was depressing yes but at least it explained the motivation and what was going on in great detail i just thought it was so helpful and i've been kind of promoting that around to some of my friends in jewish voice for peace and the task force for palestine and things like that thank you elizabeth I mean, when we started the Kumi, um, the idea of holding Kumi was is, is actually today I was speaking with the, with a friend of mine here at Sabil, um, speaking about Kumi. Um, we used to get two the most frequently asked questions when we were at when we would meet a group. People would ask us two questions. The first question is that said it's too confusing because you Palestinians have so many voices going around. We don't know to whom to listen. There's Sabil, there's others um, who speak. So could you please unite and do something together? So that was like the most common question. And that was cool. We said, like, why don't we bring everybody who's willing to work together at least? And throughout the last um, two years, we got like over 150 organizations who have joined forces. Some are Palestinian, some are Israeli. Some are um, um, some are uh, um, uh, some are Jewish, some are Christian. So many different backgrounds, and that was what we have been um, doing. For uh, um, uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody had it, this, um, that this platform was open to everybody. The second most frequently asked question was. We need something tangible to do. And this is, was the idea behind doing the Kumi actions. Um, something simple for people to do as, as a beginner, as a start, you know, let's do something about it. I mean, we're facing so many challenges here when you're working for Palestine and Israel. It's not an easy cause to struggle or to be aligned for. So that was like some of the reasons why we started the Kumi session. Um, sessions or even the Kumi project with the book and the material. And interestingly, um, so it's, uh, and interestingly, I mean, these were the seeds that, I mean, these questions were the seeds of why we need to start a Kumi um, program. So action has always been fundamental in doing the work, but it's also very challenging because it's, um, what kind of work to do? How can we do the work? People feel, although we're a community online because of uh, Zoom and technology, 
Yet we all feel sometimes very lonely and it's very difficult to act on your own. And when you go back and speak to your own church, to own your community, people feel they're very much, um, we're very much isolated from one another. Uh, or sometimes people don't understand why we're doing the work that we're doing. Not in Palestine, I'm speaking into the international context. So I'm interested because it's um, the speaker has not been present and um, has not shown up. I don't know. I hope she is OK um, and she's doing well. She's an amazing person who I've met here at Sabil um, at Palestine. We, I led a group that she was part of a group of over 15 people for over 20 days in Palestine. So it was an excellent uh, meeting. She, she's a powerful, passionate activist. And I hope she, she will join us um, later on. But I would like to ask how many of you became who are willing to share what was their introduction to Palestine? Um, not to Kumi, but in general, advocating or wanting to learn or to work on for justice and peace in Palestine. Could be a person, it could be a trip, it could be an encounter. So please, I think it would be really um, nice for you if you are willing to share. Yes, Gretchen. Uh, good afternoon. It's morning here still. Uh, I'm in Maine, USA, uh, Turtle Island, and um, I was I was very active in the Episcopal Church where I live here. Um, I wasn't raised Christian, but I was, you know, I explored spirituality and. Um, figured out I was Christian and 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 uh, it took a long time to find a church and I was raising my kids there and I saw something for a uh, peace fellowship they had a peace fellowship and I was interested in that um, so I picked up the card off a table you know in the church and and uh, contacted and got involved with Episcopal Peace Fellowship and the woman who was convener, I later became convener myself, uh, they asked me to, was, had been to um, Israel, Palestine and seen for herself. I didn't need to go there and see for myself. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. But um, so I was introduced in a peace fellowship, um, you know, uh, uh, to, to what was going on. And that was you know, the main issue that that our little group, the Episcopal Peace Fellowship main chapter um, focused on, it was really, it was really, uh, and it still is, I think, the most difficult and challenging, uh, you know, human rights, peace and justice uh, issue to, um, to be a part of at least here in this country and in European countries in general, uh, I think, you know, in rather in, in European countries and the United States and Canada, France and Germany and whatever. Um, I think in other countries, it sounds like maybe there's, you know, more acceptance by some governments of activism. And it's, it's you know, uh, just trying to get the truth out. You get a lot of, of pushback and even, you know, you know, harm done by priests and stuff here still. I, I've experienced it myself. I, I kind of learned a lot about the politics of church that way. And 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 I've just stuck with it. I was maybe back in, I think I joined the Peace Fellowship maybe in 2004. And I think I, uh, they asked me to serve as convener, I think around 2012 and 2014, the uh, the attacks on Gaza, I, I just cried buckets and buckets and buckets full. Um, I was serving as convener then and and we did we did activism here in Maine. We had on Fridays we'd have uh, and they were quite well attended actually. We had you know support for Gaza protests on Fridays down in Portland, Maine, which is uh, I don't know if that's the biggest city here. It's not the capital. I guess it's the capital, but it may be the biggest city here. Bangor's big too, but, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, and I just kept learning and I just kept trying and I've um, myself been very seriously attacked uh, 
by local Zionists here and 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 even, you know, heavier than that. It's very heavy. It's very intense. It's very life threatening in my situation, in my case, actually. Um, they've really done a lot of shenanigans. <laughs> but, you know, I learned so much. And as a Christian, standing with the oppressed is. It's a calling, you know, it's a calling like a, my Palestinian rights advocacy. I feel like I was called to church. You know, I was called to explore, explore all sorts of spirituality. I was called to find my own path. And I was, uh, and I ended up learning about Palestine and settler colonialism as a result. So I, you know, got involved with, uh, um, I attended everything I could for the, the, the Wabanaki people here, did a truth and reconciliation um, on child's welfare, child miswelfare really by the state. And, um, I went to all that and became an ally of the Wabanaki because I, they don't teach settler colonialism in high school. They, I went to college, uh, liberal arts. You're supposed to get a well-rounded education. They don't teach it. You know, you, you don't, uh, you don't know what you don't know until you know it <laughs> there. So, uh, so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, keeping on, keeping on. And I see our own democracy being eroded by uh, the attacks on free speech regarding uh, Israel, Palestine. And mm -hmm. as an American citizen, that's a responsibility too. So I keep on keeping on on two fronts as an American citizen and as a, as a Christian, um, just, I just, I just, I just, you know, kind of stumbled onto the path, you know, God's my boss. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I learn as I go as best I can. But I'm, I'm very, I'm very, uh, I think, I think in church, there's so much, there's so much understatement and politeness that's gone on that, you know, interfaith dialogue with scientists is really deadly to, to, I think, to, um, to, to getting things more, more recognized by people who don't know, like I didn't. So thank you. Thank you, Omar. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Tina? Thank you, Omar. Um, my story is um, good in parts, a bit like the curate's egg. I retired um, just over 20 years ago now and thought that um, I should do something worthwhile. So I started an academic course um, really to be ordained and then decided that that wasn't for me. So decided to become um, a lay reader. I was halfway through that course when I thought maybe I should go on to do more academia, but I'll I'll think about it. So in order to think about it, I went to um, the Holy Land. Unfortunately, the tour that I chose was so biased that I was angry for the whole 10 days. I couldn't believe that this claptrap was coming out of the mouth of a tour guide where it was supposed to show me uh, about Christianity and, and Judaism. In the hotel, they couldn't even tell me where there was a Christian church where I could worship on a Sunday. So I threw my toys out of the pram and uh, decided that um, I really should do something about this. It, it was ridiculous. If this was the message that was coming across to people who went genuinely seeking, then it was terrible. So, um, I was standing on the shores of Lake Galilee, as one does, and it was a wonderful moment. And I felt um, what Wesley called a wonderful warming. And I took that as a message from God to um, do something about the wrongs that were, were being done. So anyway, when I came back, I decided to um, actually become licensed and I've been preaching about Palestine ever since. Um, not to a great effect, I must admit, but I have had some wonderful times with marvelous people on the West Bank. 
Um, I worked in uh, Balata refugee camp in Nablus for a while, and that was awe-inspiring. Um, I'm too old now to go with the groups that are that active. So there's a little group of us in Ripon here. Um, some of them worship at Ripon Cathedral. And uh, we go together, about a dozen of us, and we have been going every year to the West Bank. We've made great friends with people in Beit Sahur. Uh, we go back and see them each time. And then a pandemic arrived. And I'm afraid I haven't been back since that started. But um, I would say to anyone who hasn't been, go and see. It's it will change your life. So yes, that's my story. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much, Tina. Dorothy? Hello, I'm Dorothy in the northeast of England. My story goes back to uh, around about 2000. And my best friend for actually for 20 odd years is Muslim, Nesreen. Um, we were involved in Teesside Against the War. And, you know, we spent many afternoons, tea and coffee as friends, talking about the Palestinian situation. And one story that stuck in my head, how she tried to explain it to me, was imagine that you're living in a house and then someone says, well, you can't live in that house anymore. You've got to live in a tent in the garden. And... So, but the people who've moved into your house are not happy just with the house. They want your tent as well. And they're driving you out and they don't care. And we had many conversations like that. And thanks to the Muslim people, I actually got to understand the situation through them. And uh, I was uh, the secretary of Teesside Against the War. And in 2008, 2009, I was really upset when I saw what was happening in Gaza. And I emailed here, there and everywhere. And I had quite an inroad with the Muslim population and just sent a message, anyone who can do anything, please do it. Someone, anybody with any whatever power. And it led to us having the, the biggest procession for Palestine that Middlesbrough had experienced. But I was still at my early phases and I started to go on pilgrimages and again, I had a lakeside um, uh, thing as well at, Gar at Galilee when I was praying to God because I wanted to know about the living stones and I wanted to be with them and to find out. I was concerned about how there was a reduction of Christians in the Holy Land. And it led me to doing voluntary work first for three months at uh, Nazareth Village, dressed up at the time of Jesus for tourist people, but inside, I didn't feel very satisfied, and I got and I was asking about Sabil because I'd heard of Sabil, and I was already circulating the Sabil prayers, even though Sabil didn't know. And I got talking to Radia, and uh, and who is Sabil Nazareth, and that was a very very interesting time for me. And I, when I left there, I said to Radia, I said, "We're only just beginning. Please stay in touch." And since then, Radi has been sending me uh, what's going on over there, and I've been circulating it on Facebook. And uh, she can, uh, told me about Sabil Jerusalem. So I, I thought, I'm not satisfied with Nazareth. I, I am, you know, I've learned about the Israeli Arabs. Now I would like to get involved in Sabil because that's really what's in my heart and my passion. And so... I went on a couple of tours with Sabil and a couple of times there was a, 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 a grand meeting where I saw Radia again and then Omar was coming to England, Oxford and I thought well I've got, I live up in the northeast but I've got to support Omar and so I went down to the meeting in, in Oxford and, um, and I think it was there or was it later and another meeting then in the northeast and Omar just said to me Dorothy, why don't you volunteer for us? And it was like the Holy Spirit, in a sense, was asking me to go and volunteer because that was my passion. That's what I wanted to do. So I spent <laughs> I spent three months tormenting Omar, you know, and learning more about Sabil. 
and, and doing bits and pieces. And then uh, I went, I think I went back for another month as well. I guess I did two visits and learned a lot about Sabil and the situation and what it's like for people who live in Jerusalem. And I felt the last meeting was horrifying because it was when Trump said, when he said, you know, uh, Jerusalem belongs to the Israelis. And at that time, and I, I would have voiced it in the office as well, I can see where this is leading. Um, Israel will take over and be throwing people out of their homes which is inevitably what they've done. I mean, Trump's done a tremendous amount of damage. But I'm still in, in contact uh, with Omar. The only thing that stopped me going back more recently is I had trouble with my legs, so I'm not as physically fit as I was when I was there. And, I, 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 and I've been doing a little bit of voluntary work as well for Omar, illustrating some, some stories, folk stories. So I'm... Just every day I try to put something on Facebook in the hope that, you know, people read it and circulate it and that people become more aware. And it's been a very sad, sad time over the last three, day, four days. So that that is it. I'm, I'm sorry it was such a long story, but um, it took me a while to get into it all. But I love being a part of this community because... It gives me hope because this is about the truth of the way things are. And, and it's such a relief, actually, to belong to the truth as opposed to the ways where people lie about what's actually happening in the world. So it's wonderful to be with like-minded spirits. So that's my story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Layla has joined the speaker for today, but um, we'll, we'll continue what we are doing. Um, uh, Ted? Um, our story began uh, in a very different way. We were um, part of a church that uh, worked with a center in Jerusalem that did tours for, um, the tours were called Um, um, we're, we're not hearing you, sorry, since that there's a problem with the connection. Experience as well, the, the founder and the head of the center was a Sephardic Jew whose family had been in Jerusalem for a couple of generations. And Ted is Syrian and his father actually was born in Syria. And he told Ted, you're too assimilated. You need to get out among your people. So on Saturdays, he let us take the center's car, which they couldn't drive, and go out uh, uh, and to see things, to go out and be among Palestinians. Well, we were horrified. It reminded us of the 60s in the US with Jim Crow. And um, anyway, we, we got our education of what was really happening on the ground we left there in October 2000 when the second intifada broke out. Um, but when we went back, because we were so supportive of the Palestinians, we were persona non grata in our church. And we started to look for sources and our, we very quickly found Daryl Myers, who became our mentor, our pastor. Uh, I think very, I think we actually went to meet him at a Seville meeting and um, he was our, um, I don't know what to say, but you couldn't have anybody better than Daryl Myers to lead you. And um, we, our, our children didn't know what had happened to us because we were very conservative politically and everything and our whole lives were <laughs> turned around. And, um, uh, you know, we are so thankful and, and I remember meeting Naeem for the first time at a Sabil conference in Pasadena, California. And uh, I got, in fact, I got him to autograph his book. And then I told him, I'm really having trouble. I cannot read the Old Testament anymore. And he said, read it through the lens of Jesus. And that became such a saving thing, you know, for me. But 
we're so, so thankful um, for that experience of living there and being encouraged to go out among the Palestinian people. But, you know, we, we drove to Bethlehem and it was hot, very hot and we're seeing women holding babies standing in long lines at the checkpoints. And of course that was nothing compared to what it is today. But anyway, we're very thankful that our lives did get turned around. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara and, uh, um, and T.Y., we have uh, Layla Johnson with us. Hi, Layla. So we will get back to you. We'd love to hear what you have said, but it's also, um, we'd like to welcome our speaker. Just, uh, hi, Layla, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. And that was a beautiful story to walk into. Um, we're glad that you're doing well. Um, we started just to have a chat. Um, our community is a community of friends. We're, we're a family. Um, uh, many of the faces, even new faces become easily familiar that this is a family. So I, I was just mentioning that Layla, um, when did we meet? It was It has been, was it 2018, 19? It, it must have been, uh, yeah, around that time, 2017, 2018. So it's been a little while. Yes. I came. I came to Palestine, and uh, and you opened our eyes uh, quite a bit as well, um, even more than they already were. So yeah, it was it was a, a heartbreaking and and motivating trip. Um, I mean, it's really um, we get the credit, but it's actually the, the 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 country by itself speaks for itself. When you see the checkpoints, when you see the injustice, when you see um, military with guns. When you see so much oppression, it, it, you really don't need to be a good guide or so on. But it's I really enjoyed being with you and Laila. Um, you are uh, you have left very strong impression um, on me personally and on many people here in Palestine. Um, you're a true leader, a genuine uh, leader, um, and you, you're a good. When we when now I think as Omar. I think of a person to speak about um, indigenous communities to defend indigenous rights. I, your name just jumps up, although we got the, the privilege to meet so many different people. Um, so we would like you to introduce yourself as this has been the tradition at Sabir, and we would like you to speak um, very briefly, and we're going to open it up for questions um, later on. Um, on maybe just a little bit because of the time limitation on what you Palestine, also recognizing in the, um, the fight for indigenous rights and recognitions in the U.S. Um, Turtle Island, and um, uh, the similarities and the differences. Yeah, well, first of all, yeah, at Eshik Eh Ara Shid in the Esh E Nanish Eje Trachit Ninishla, um, Tsetses is Bashishin Ashin Hidashi, Bilagana E Dashinelli, uh, Lila June Dashidine. Uh, Taos, New Mexico, so my name is Isla June. I'm from the Nanisht Ejit Kachitni clan of the Dene Nation. We are also incorrectly known as um, Navajo. And uh, uh, we are indigenous to what is now called um, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. Um, and uh, that's on my mother's side. On my father's side, I'm <clears throat> part European of Scottish ancestry, as well as Southern Cheyenne, as well as probably other things that I don't know. Um, and um, so uh, very happy to be here. And I'm sorry I was a little late. I was very, very honored to, to spend time among the land, you know, in Palestine and definitely broke my heart. And uh, I saw myself in in the people a lot. Um, and uh, I, actually the first time I had heard about Palestine was quite quite a long time ago. Um, it was, uh, I was at a UN thing in Geneva and a Palestinian man from Gaza, uh, uh, I'm in Quedar. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but he, beautiful man. Uh, he literally just spent one hour with us in a cafe and I, I was forever changed, you know, just the stories he told me and I knew I had to, to try to help. So the, the similarities that I see are abundant, you know, there's so many, but uh, one thing that strikes me is the uh, ecological, you know, ecological 
destruction alongside the cultural destruction. You know, the, when, when we went to Palestine and I saw the, the pine trees that they were planted from their homelands uh, and, and sort of an invasive type of pine, you know, uh, and, and then on one hand, putting in these certain ecological elements, but then on the other hand, taking out certain ecological elements. You know, we went to the, uh, I believe it's called the city of tents, or perhaps you can put the correct name in the chat, Omar, but uh, Omar took us to this beautiful family who, um, their olive trees were all cut down, you know, by um, people who didn't like the fact that they still had a land holding in, in, in Palestine. Is this family surrounded by, you know, uh, Israeli settle settlements um, and the, 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 the neighbors would harass them and come and harass them and <clears throat> one day came and, and yeah, Tent of Nations, thank you, Tent of Nations, and came to cut down all of their olive trees and they had this beautiful grove, you know, all around them of olive trees and the, what they told me when I went there was they said that when they cut down the olive trees, it felt like they were cutting down like they were killing their own family members and I found that to be very fascinating because. The sheep behind me, these are this is my people's way we are we're shepherds uh, and to us our animals are like our family members and the plants are like our family members and if you hang out with the Lakota the Lakota nation you'll hear them say that the buffalo. Have their own Oyate their own nation and that the buffalo are their relatives. Um, and so to us, killing an animal is no different from killing a human. Um, we may eat an animal if we really, really need to. And when we do, we use every single bit just to honor the fact that we, we took its life um, and to prove that we didn't do it unnecessarily. And so um, that really struck me, you know, this, this indigenous, pattern that I see throughout the world, because I've been lucky to visit indigenous peoples all around the world, uh, in Australia, in the, the Gazignon people who have been oppressed by the Thai kingdom and forced into Buddhism, forced in to speak Thai, um, uh, the brothers and sisters from Nam Namibia, um, brothers and sisters from South Africa, brothers and sisters from the Sami nation, you know, indigenous peoples around the world for some reason, I'm not sure why, we have this kinship with with animals and plants that we view them as our relatives. Um, and so, you know, to, to cut down a whole grove of olives, you know, these trees are like their people, you know, and um, we're meant to live together, you know, the olives and the people are meant to live together. Uh, they, they're not just, it's not just family in a poetic sense. We actually have a real biological um, connection, even our very breath, you know, stimulates their micro microbial activity and the trees, the things that they emit stimulate our microbial activity. So we are very much related, um, biologically meant to live together. Um, and so that was one big parallel. Uh, of course, I, I've written about this before, but the, um, the exploitation of any kind of resistance, using that to frame us as violent terrorists um, is something that Native people here in Turtle Island, aka, you know, the United States of America, something we went through as well, because you have this onslaught of people trying to, to overtake your lands using all kinds of strange justifications like, oh, they're not Christian enough. Uh, they don't farm enough. Um, they don't, um, they're not, uh, their hair is too long. Um, you know, just finding all these random cultural differences to say, oh, they don't deserve to live. They don't deserve their land. They're savages. Um, and so as they were overtaking our homeland, any little bit of resistance was quickly appropriated and exploited to, um, paint us as savages even more, you know, so, uh, you know, any little, um, like in Palestine, like any uh, rock throwing or any anything is, is weaponized against us again to paint us as savages, you know, or terrorists or what have you. All the while, that's a smokescreen for the real, um, 
for the real savage behavior that's going on, for the real terrorist behavior that's going on. Um, and so that bothers me quite a bit, you know, that, uh, and I am, I am completely committed to nonviolence and I always will be. That's just who I am. That's how I was born. I just can't change that. Um, but I, I, it does bother me when other brothers and sisters who do succumb to violent behavior or do succumb to some kind of physical resistance are immediately um, put down even more, you know, um, like the Battle of Little Bighorn. You know, we killed Custer that day. You know, we, uh, Cheyenne Lakota people killed uh, an American cavalry leader, uh, George Custer. But when we did that, ooh, the US government came back with a vengeance. They, they did a full scale war on our buffalo and slaughtered millions of them. And that was by and large catalyzed by our assassination of Custer. So that was like the only battle we ever won, you know, in the whole history of, of, of armed conflict between the US and native people. And it was quickly used to just subjugate us even more. Uh, it reminds me of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, right? They came back and bombed um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which was full of women and children. You know, that seems to be the US and other people's um, MO is to um, take any little offense and just, just come back times 1000 to just give this message of like, do not mess with us, you know? And it's so intense and it's so, it's it's uh, it's it's orders of magnitude more uh, atrocious, and so it, it bothers me that that we're in that position where we're just cuffed, you know. And um, I could go on. How are we doing on time, Omar? Should I keep going? Yes, keep going. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> I think on a related note, you know, um, the. The, the PR campaign, right? The once colonial powers attain some level of influence, they then become arbiters of truth, um, jurors of scientific fact, um, and 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 writers of narratives because they then control media, they control cinema, newspapers, and other forms of narrative production. And so um, here in the US, once they destroyed us, uh, they, they, they distorted the story here and they continue to do so. Um, for example, a lot of scientific racism, right? Science is weaponized to say, oh, well, these people, they would measure our crania, you know, they would dig up our peoples from our cemeteries and measure our crania, look at our jawbones just to prove we weren't human, to prove we were more ape-like. Um, they, they would also use science to say, oh, well, they're, they're not really from here, you know? Um, they came across the Bering Strait. Um, so they're just immigrants like we are. <laughs> and um, so we didn't really steal land from anyone because we're pretty much just as new as they are here. Well, they just found a, 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 a mammoth butchering site, if you will, a site where a mammoth was systematically harvested and butchered in New Mexico. It was 35,000 years old, you know, so that predates the Bering, the time when we were supposed to come over the Bering Strait by 20,000 years. So um, the Bering Strait theory was used to uh, say we aren't really from from here. Um, there's other strange scientific justifications like, oh, well, they didn't really live here. They just roamed around like in Kentucky, they call it uh, the dark and bloody earth theory. They say, oh, well, no one really lived in Kentucky. Uh, they just used it as a hunting ground. They would just go, they would pass through, but no one really lived there, you know? <laughs> which is such a convenient, you know, thing. Like we didn't steal land from anyone, uh, because no one really lived here. It's, and it's, it's it's really to soothe the guilty conscience of colonial society, right? So I think that's true in uh, Palestine as well, where there's all kinds of different narratives that try to say Palestinians aren't really from there. Um, and 
and they don't really belong there and we're not taking land from anyone you know and and that's just so sad to me because we're all related we're all brothers and sisters and cousins and and we're all yes people migrate and move but but we're all mixed and we're all having lineages of that land and and the culture and the language of that land you know is so important um my my elder said that a native american language is is the sound of that place speaking through humanity it's the sound of that land speaking through human beings and so these languages developed over millennia in certain places and so even if a palestinian person isn't 100 percent genetically indigenous to that place because they've been mixing hopefully they have if you just if you never mix you become inbred right so hopefully you're mixing with other populations but you have a strand of indigenous roots there going back very very far but but even if even without that truth the fact that palestinians carry the culture and the language of that land they know how to speak to the olive trees they know how to speak to the soil they know how to speak to the fish because they lived there for so long they have the science of that land dialed in and so when you destroy the people you also destroy whole ecological relationships um, because those people uphold those relationships um, so anyways, I think that um, that it's it's unfortunate that these I mean, I think the demonization of Palestine and the glorification of Israel might be one of the most expensive and large scale PR campaigns the world has ever seen, you know, it's, it's so, there's so much money in it. I mean, you might say Nazi Germany was second in line, but it, there's very few PR campaigns. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong in saying that. Let, let's just say it's a very big PR campaign and very expensive and they spend tons of money. My grandma watches the Christian television here in, in, in the house and it's full of oh poor israel oh my god and it's just like it's insane you know and and it, it bothers me that 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 um it's going on but like my friend said you know and I'll, I'll end with this is you know they say that history is written by the victors but how could there be a victor when the war isn't over you know we're still here we're still fighting each and every day with each of you and um we don't have any weapons except for weapons of truth and faith and love. And I believe that those are the only weapons we need. And so as 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 painful as it's been, and as 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 challenging as it's been, I do believe that with our faith in the creator and with our hearts, if we keep putting one step in front of the other, we will win the most important war, which is the war, the spiritual war. And we will bring uh, something beautiful to this earth and we will bring uh, truth to this earth. And if we keep staying close to our heart, uh, we can't, we can't fail. Thank you, um, Layla. I mean, it is, I confessed this before to you, but I will confess it again. As little kids, you know, it is, a, there was like one or two TV channels and the only shows that they were showing was actually cowboy uh, movies. Cowboys and red Indians and then, you know, it is, it's, when we Palestinian kids were not throwing stones, or uh, which we actually did, and the uh, block roads or write graffiti, and we'd play games and we'd play cowboys and Indians. And I would be like, it is, it's the older boys, um, we would want to be the cowboys, and we go and hunt the Indians. And then I graduated from school. I remember we used to make my, my, uh, my younger brother and the other little kids be the Red Indians. And once I, I, it was very, I went to college and then there I was doing a research and I read an article. And I read the article through, I mean, it was somebody was comparing, I was doing something, a paper for school on Palestine. And it was comparing, you know, it was, I think it was on Thanksgiving, but it was speaking about, and then it, it just hit me that we were Palestinians, you know, it is, it's how, how stupid. And I viewed myself as an, you know, as a more aware person of what was happening. And it was, it's a very strong media campaign in a way that we demonize each other. I mean, um, in a way we, we somehow that we see that we are inferior 
um, uh, to others, which is really how could people, people who respect themselves, you know, it is a people who, who should know better, we fall into this trap of, uh, um, into this media trap. So I need to confess I was a victim too, and it's um, out of something that should have been really um, obvious. Yeah, in, 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 in what we now call America, we say nothing is lower than an Indian. Meaning, while many other minorities have made leaps and bounds, we still remain either invisible or not really human. Um, and nothing is lower than us, even apparently around the world, you know, people are still hunting us down in a game. And, and that's really due to um, something we've talked about, what I've talked about in other panels regarding Palestine, which is the profound need for colonial culture to dehumanize their subjugates, right? It's, it's you, we cannot knowingly consciously on a mass scale kill human beings. We have to convince ourselves they're not human or they're so awful that they deserve to die. We Otherwise, on a mass scale, you can't mobilize people to do that to other people so or mobilize yourself. And so to, to dehumanize native people is an ancient thing. It happened from the British to the Celtic, the Scottish and the Welsh. Um, the Welsh were always seen as beasts, you know, beasts who lived in the woods. Um, the Thai kingdom has always dehumanized non-Buddhist hill tribes as uncivilized people. And, oh, if only they became Buddhist, they'd be human, you know. So Buddhism, a beautiful spiritual, you know, path has been weaponized. Uh, anyone who's non-Buddhist in Thailand is, is immediately deemed as unhuman. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that the fact that you could that you could play that game is not your fault. It's it's the product of many many centuries of dehumanization, where we could be hunted. Right? Uh, it was it was legal to hunt Native Americans in California for money. You, you would get money in Sacramento for every scalp that you uh, that you brought. And so uh, we what, what's what's so crazy though, right? Is usually the people we dehumanize are the most human, are the most civilized, are the most um, in touch with, uh, with, with reality uh, and, and most in touch with ecology. You know, this constant demonization of forest people, which is what I think savage really means etymologically. Just for living in the forest, we're, we're not human. But ironically, it's those who live among the forest, know how to tend the forest, know how to take care of the forest, who are the most human. And so it's it's all a big trick, you know, and it's been going on in different places all over the world for so long. The Romans did it to the Samachi, the, the Samachi pagans, right? It's just it's the same old story again and again and 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 we we got to we got to learn from history and I believe we will. Um I want to ask you a question actually and um, um in Palestine when people would get arrested or people would get interrogated, and we, we go into a confrontation with our, with our, um, uh, um, with the police within the army. We always, as Palestinians, the first thing we tell in confrontation with the soldiers, you know, always the freedom fighters win. You know, that's in, in the heated debate. Um, always the colonizers get defeated, but they usually see not always look at the, um, what happened um, with the Red Indians. That would, would be like, and when we Palestinians um, in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, or 15, with the Standing Rock, it was so much, very much welcomed, but it was like a resurrection from um, coming from indigenous people in the U um, uh, North America, just, or certain islands, just saying, you know, it is, it's, uh, we're still here, we're still fighting. What other stories of hope do you have for our people when they say indigenous people have lost the fight? Uh, there we go, sorry. Um, 
Yeah, that is a good question. Um, there's so much hope. I'll tell you a story. Um, back in the day, the Tsetsestas nation, uh, today they're called the Cheyenne, or we call ourselves the Tsetsestas. We were fighting the US government militarily for a long time. We had certain warrior societies, etc. And then one day, our leaders, who used to be um, military leaders, they said, we're not going to fight you anymore. We're done. No more. No more of this bloodshed. No more of this, no more of this um, shooting bullets at each other, killing each other. And we turned in all our weapons and we and we put up a white flag of surrender and we said we're we're officially done <laughs> and after that the u.s cavalry we were camped at, uh, near sand creek the u.s cavalry came and and killed 530 women and children men men women and children they knew we were surrendered. They knew we had turned in our guns. They, they knew we had given the letter to the army, to the cavalry. And they took that opportunity to go in and slaughter us. This is called Sand Creek Massacre. Now, some might say like, those Cheyenne, they didn't protect their women that day. What cowards, you know. But we say that the way the Cheyenne carried themselves that day is the reason there's even one drop of Cheyenne blood left on the planet. Because that day reverberated throughout America in the media, even for that time in the 1860s, I believe it was, when the media wasn't like today where you have Facebook and whatnot. Um, it, it, it shocked the whole country. The whole country saw how savage the US government was, how disgusting the US project of extermination was. And it changed American policy towards Native people forever. <clears throat> and although many of us died that day and we lost a battle, we won the war because we chose peace that day. And so many of my contemporaries disagree with me. <laughs> they think I'm crazy when I say this, but I don't care. We won the war, the spiritual war of, of not fighting, not killing another human being. And even though our bodies died, our, our spirits were eternalized that day. And we made a sacrifice that changed American policy forever. And from that day forward, extermination of native people was no longer permissible. And they switched to assimilation. They switched to putting us in boarding schools, which wasn't good either, right? <laughs> but at least I'm here, at least I'm alive, you know? At least I'm here to tell this story. And so I really believe that peace is our hope. I believe that nonviolence is our hope. And I believe that the hope comes from the very fact that it really doesn't matter what our oppressors do. If we follow the line of, 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 of beauty, of truth, of, of love, of nonviolence, of, of faith, then we literally cannot lose they could take our body away. We we'll still have one because the war is not a physical one. So no matter what the world does, we always are in control of our ability to win that war. And we always have leaders who show us that it's possible. And so I think that, that that's hope is not just a thing that I try to grasp onto. It's right here every moment, every day, because I know I'm in control of my prayer. I'm in control of my, my love. And as long as I choose that in every moment 
and I take the higher ground, I might lose my body, I might die, but I will change the world forever. And I will help future descendants who, who need that. They need us to show up in that way. Is that easy? No. Is it fair that we even have to make these decisions? No, it's not. But here we are. And, and, and if we can, that I, I believe that's the decision to make. And that's the decision that we always have, which is where I derive my hope. Um, I want to ask another question, uh, Layla. Um, I, I want your advice. Um, because there's so many similarities, as you said, between, I mean, it is, it's how the indigenous people in the um, North America, Turtle Island have been demonized. The same thing with Palestinians, where the same lies, nobody was here. Also, that's what um, Israel has um, claims or the Zionist movement. One also narrative that um, we always hear, it is, it's about the victimhood of our oppressors. So, um, I mean, it is, it's the immigrants who came mainly from Europe, they were suffering themselves, truly, that's a, a historical fact. And the same thing with um, uh, the Zionists, many of the Zionists who came into, um, uh, um, into Palestine, where they were victims of anti-Semitism and problems. How do, we, how do you deal as a person, as a, um, uh, as a community leader, when you are engaged with this question, as a person with high spirituality, how do you deal also that our oppressors are victims themselves? I think there's a difference between being a victim and exploiting your situation for personal gain. Um, I'm sure there are many uh, Jewish descendants who truly believe they are healing by coming home. But there's powers behind the scenes, as we know, <laughs> that just see it as another land grab and, and actually use those other well-meaning Jewish people as, as pawns. And I feel like we see that here in the US where many Christians are used like pawns, you know, by political parties that really don't care about Christian values, really don't care about um, what, what Jesus really showed us how to live. Uh, but, but they want that vote, right? And they want that constituency. So the exploitation of human groups by saying, oh, you're, you're a poor victim, let us help you, you know, then you, you essentially gain a bunch of constituents who might be well meaning. And I feel like a lot of Zionism is, is that it's, it's the appropriation of, of the masses of, of Jewish, some Jewish Zionists, for, for a much bigger and a much more um, dubious <laughs> uh, ul ulterior motives, you know, namely having a, an army base in, in that part of the world for the US, you know, it's a big, big part of it. America wants a place where we can e exist and have power. Um, and on and on and on. I don't need to tell everyone here, you already know so much more than I do. Uh, but yeah, I think for me, it's, it's a balance. It's like, I actually do support a lot of colonial people here in the US because I know that they're hurting and I know that they are, you know, creator's children. And I know that they are suffering from the witch trials, you know, the destruction, destruction of women in Europe for thousands of years, burning them alive drowning them, uh, torturing them in torture chambers, uh, the destruction of indigenous European cultures by the Romans, uh, by, by monarchies. And so, you know, uh, Europe was essentially just a pressure cooker of trauma for 2000 years. And they, they adopted this strategy of hoarding, not because they're evil people, but because they were in so much trauma for so many centuries where it's just you better get yours today because it's dog eat dog you know that's europe was dog eat dog for 2000 years straight if not more 
the the amount of bloodshed you know in in spain i think there's over 20 documented periods of full-scale war you know in that little area and so when we really look at what the colonizers brought here <laughs> we have to understand they're very sick people and they still are and i don't mean sick in a demonizing way but there's literally sick their spirits are sick their hearts are sick as we've learned from epigenetics, which shows that you inherit your 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 forebearers trauma, they're carrying so much trauma that they don't even know how to name. They don't even know that when Britain marched into Scotland, Scotland, they found the bards first, the, the storytellers, the Scottish culture bearers, and they would kill them first and bury them face down so that their stories would die with them. So many people in the US are Scottish, we don't even realize we're carrying this level of trauma. And so on one hand, I'm like, okay, colonizer society, like, stop crying, get up, like, take accountability, you know, <laughs> there, there is that part of me. And I think that is actually a helpful thing to do. But there's this other part of me that's like, yeah, um, you are carrying a lot of trauma. And I wonder sometimes if we can help them heal that trauma. And when I say them, I should really say us because I am Scottish and white as well. If we could heal our own trauma as white people, we would be able to better feel the trauma we're inflicting on others. Um, and so I guess I don't have a clear answer to your question, but I, I think it's both. On one hand, really taking time to help the colonizer grieve. And, and when we do that as their oppressed subjugates, it's really it's really quite generous of us right like we're taking the time to hold space for someone who's actively hurting us they feel that they see that they see that forgiveness they see that higher road that we're taking and it can be transformative at the same time i don't think we're doing colonial society any favors by not putting a mirror up to them and not showing them like no what you're doing is wrong we are humans deal with it <laughs> like you got to deal with this um and while it's very scary and hard at first if you give it a generation or two they'll finally start to look um i, I have another question uh, for you uh, um Leila. um i i remember when we were in bethlehem actually at next to the church of the nativity you said in a way that your um your role model is I think if I, Mary Magdalene, if I'm not mistaken, at that time. Um, um, I'm not sure if my memory is right. Um, do you remember? I'm sorry, uh, I was, say that one more time, sorry. Um, when we were at in Bethlehem um, with the group at the Church of the Nativity, you mentioned that your model, or role model was Mary Magdalene. Is she still your role model? Ah, uh, my grandmother was Mary Magdalene. Uh, no, your no. role model. Oh, thank you. Sorry, my role model. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, she is still my role model. I, and I want to ask you a question. Within, when it comes to spirituality, empire uses religion. So even in Christianity, early Christianity, although Rome and the powerful made Jesus refugee, slaughtered Bethlehem, um, crucified Jesus, somehow they ended up taking Jesus to Rome. <laughs> in a way, religion. Religion becomes somehow um, aligned with uh, um, or ma manipulated by the powerful. The same thing everywhere around the world. How can indigenous people from different backgrounds remain um, their connection, spirituality, especially when, when empire corrupts it or attempts to corrupt? Yeah, well, it, it, to me, religion is not the root. It's just one of many offshoots. And at the root is this human need to justify our immoral behavior. So we use excuses of religious superiority, cultural superiority, intellectual superiority, biological, natural superiority, like, oh, these people are just apes. Um, and also this other strange one we find is um, agri like the way we use land is superior to them. They don't even farm, they don't even, they live in whatever, the way they, they 
in the way that they interface with the earth is inferior. So to me, religious superiority is just one of so many tools, but at the root is, is this human need to justify our, our, our land seizure and uh, seizure of labor as well. Seizure of, um, you know, enslaving people, taking land. So religion is, is, to me, it's just one of those things. And it's very, very convenient, right? Because it embedded within religion is this moral uh, code. So if you can somehow take that mor moral code and twist it and distort it into your own religious superiority, then you could do whatever the hell you want, which is what people want, right? They want a license to seize land. They want a license to kill. They need that because if they find that license, then on the other end, so much spoils await them, so much treasure, land, money, uh, whatever awaits them. And of course, these are mostly men who do this, right? Because of, I won't get into that, but how their own masculinity has been turned against them. Uh, but I, I feel that, um, like I said, uh, it's happened throughout the world, you know, uh, even Buddhism. How, how do you manage to appropriate Buddhism and weaponize Buddhism? <laughs> but they do. And um, it's just fascinating to me how, how that works. Um, I believe it happened here in, in, in America as well before Columbus got here. I, I would not be the least bit surprised if the Incan Empire or the Aztec Empire uh, leveraged some kind of religious superiority over the people that they were subjugating and taking land from and, and murdering. Um, but again, it, it goes back to this, first there's greed, right? You want something, you want power, you want land, you want women, you want whatever. And then there's this bothersome and annoying wall in the way, which is, oh, your conscience knows that that's wrong. So then you, you, you avert that wall through all these really creative and disgusting justifications, right? Of like, oh, well, they haven't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So it's actually fine if I uh, completely destroy and overtake their home, homeland because it says right here in the Bible that, um, da, 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 you know? and so it's, it's just, it's just, um, it's just, it's just one more way of of seizing land to me i don't think it's personal i don't think it's original i don't think it's it's been it's been happening for so long and it's so paper thin literally paper thin because it's based on paper books what's written on on paper um but um i would ask you a question back to you is um just as religion has been used to oppress people do you feel as though it has been used by the oppressed to liberate themselves, even if it's the same very religion that their oppressors have? Uh, and I think particularly about Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and how he took Christianity and he took all the beautiful parts of it and then reflected it back to his oppressor and said, hey, <laughs> you know, you're saying this, um, but you're not living it. You know, I I'm just curious, do you think that that it can be turned, that it can be flipped again into something beautiful. And yeah, if not. Is, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, most of the times when religion is by, is in the hands of the powerful, um, uh, is actually, it's unfortunately, it's a tool of oppression. And when it's in the hands of the people who are marginalized, it's a tool of liberation. More, not always, but most of the times. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, religion sometimes help us with our steadfastness, with our patience, with our hope when we're um, when there's no reason to hope. And it's also a way to manipulate the masses. So there's always this struggle. I mean, in Jesus, Jesus says um, that we cannot worship power and money and God at the same time. Um, it's only um, either God or money. Um, and I mean, that's a way if it's, if we decide to follow power and uh, money and 
whatever we can we can't there's no space for god so it's definitely and this is what sabil is and this is what palestinian liberation theology it is it's uh, we are we feel liberated and strengthened by our faith and this is what helps us uh, to continue our uh, resilience we need the spirituality we need a faith in in a, in a greater being in god but we also need fellowship community and that's what the church is and this is what our friends are including you laila Laila, you have to continue the struggle. You and our uh, other dedicated sisters and brothers, um, um, uh, um, indigenous people around the world, keep up doing the good fight. You're in the into the in the belly of the of the monster, unfortunately. Um, uh, with the U.S., you have the strongest um, colonial power to deal with. We are doing the good fight over here. Um, we should. Our success should strengthen each other. And if we do mistakes, we learn from each other. And uh, there's also many of our oppressors are also sometimes our friends. And there's many people who come from North America, from other countries that used to be um, empires who are on this uh, call, who are also in solidarity with us. Um, thank you so much, Laila. It's too bad um, we didn't get a chance to benefit from the whole hour, but it's worth thanks for the patience of everybody who remained faithful with us. Um, I hope we'll have another chance to, to meet you um, again and to host you for another uh, discussion. Uh, Laila, you, you're an amazing person, and it's, uh, um, we're blessed to have you with us. Keep up the good work, and thank you. You inspire me every day, Omar. Uh, I love you all very much, and I will continue to pray for more and more ways to to support you and your people and all people. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Layla. Thank you. Take care and God bless you. Thank you all for um, for being with us in another session, and hope to see you next week. Um, next week is also an exciting um, uh, program and an exciting topic. So what I think it's the U.S. role when it comes to Palestine. And I don't think that you need some introduction to this. The U.S. doesn't play a very good role in Palestine. <laughs> They're part of the problem. But we'll help you understand the problem um, in a deeper sense. See you next week, and God bless you. And take care. Keep Gaza, Nablus, and Palestine in your prayers. Thank you, friends.